So we're going to start here with non-operative treatment. Matt had to do a lot of studying for this because he doesn't understand what that means, <laughs> non-operative treatment for young shoulder OA. All right. Well, this will be the first time I've considered this treatment modality for my arthritic patients. Okay, uh, so non-operative treatment for arthritis in young patients. So what is the problem? Uh, we know that glenohumeral humor arthritis is something that increases with age. We know that the population in general is going to have more arthritic changes in their shoulder joints as they age. And we know that certain injury patterns in the past can predispose patients to arthritis. From a patient standpoint, the real problem is that arthritis happens in young patients who want to act. Uh, we want to uh, lift weights, we want to go to the gym, we want to punch the heavy boxing bag at the gym. And when you have an arthritic shoulder, all these are limited. Thank you very much. All these are limited by your pain. So the goal of treatment for osteoarthritis non-operatively is to restore your function, minimize your symptoms, and get you back to doing the things uh, that you want to do uh, as a patient. Um, the treatment options that we're going to discuss today, I've got non-operative. My colleagues have arthroscopic debridement cam surgeries, resurfacing arthroplasty. You'll hear that from the, from the rest of the panel. Non-operative treatment is not that exciting to discuss because we're surgeons, we like to operate, but I think it's very important, and this is the way we're going to treat the majority of our patients for the majority of time that we see them. Now, this is a busy slide. We're going over a lot of different things on this slide. There's several options to treat patients non-operatively. you make the, that font a little smaller next time, I, Matt? I just don't want you to see everything I wrote on there. Um, and actually, I wish I had my glasses because it's hard for me to see. Uh, first thing uh, that we, we start with is anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, diclofenacs, and approxims, these kind of things. What do we know about anti-inflammatories? If you look at the literature, one half to two thirds of patients that are treated with anti-inflammatories will have some pain relief benefit from these things. So these are always good first line. The key things to watch out for when your patients are GI distress, renal insufficiency, I can't say that I'm uh, checking basic metabolic profiles in all my patients, but if they have renal insufficiency, you might not want to keep them on these medications uh, indefinitely. Over-the-counter things that you can do for arthritis, uh, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, to MSM. What does the data show on these? Certain patients get benefits from these things. Studies have been done mostly in knee arthritis that show comparable results to Celebrex. So this might be a good first-line option. These are supplements. Sometimes patients feel like supplements are better than prescription uh, medications. They're more uh, amenable to trying these things, but supplements are not regulated, so I tell you not to get the most expensive one on the market, not to get the cheapest one, go somewhere in the middle. Uh, physical therapy, I think, is important for non-operative therapy uh, for these patients. A lot of times patients get capsular contractures, and by restoring your motion, you can maximize some of your function, maybe decrease some of your symptoms by strengthening the muscles that got weak from uh, the contracture. Injections. This is a pretty hot topic. Dr. West mentioned earlier she does not like to do intra-articular cortisone injections. I agree with her, especially for this uh, patient population. These are patients that are going to be yours for the long haul. If you start giving intra-articular cortisone injections, we know that this can make partial thickness rotator cuff tears progress, and it can also make full thickness rotator cuff tears grow. So cortisone injections for me are, are kind of a last resort for this patient population. I want to preserve the cuff as much as possible so that if they ultimately get an anatomic arthroplasty, they're going to have a cuff that functions and is as uh, intact as it can be. Other injections we can do is Toradol. I like Toradol a lot. The patient, or excuse me, the pain relief benefits from Toradol are similar to cortisone, and it doesn't have any cuff side effects. You can do hyaluronic acid injections. Currently, there's a study going on at HSS evaluating HA and PRP injections. Most of the HA studies, again, have been in the knee literature and they've been mixed results. So we're not exactly sure how well hyaluronic acid injections do in the shoulder. I have a lot of patients that come in and they've had them in the past from other docs. They want to continue those things. So I think that's a reasonable thing to do. PRP, again, uh, kind of a hot topic injection point, but we don't really know how well it works. It's fairly expensive. If patients want it, I think it's reasonable. If I'm going to PRP inject your shoulder, I'm going to use a, a leukocyte or PRP solution to minimize inflammation uh, with those injections. And then there's stem cells. Stem cells uh, in my practice are extremely expensive for patients to use uh, with a benefit that I, I have to say is, is pretty questionable and unknown. So for me, I, I have a hard time looking somebody in the eye and, and charging three, four, five thousand dollars for a, uh, a stem cell injection that may or may not work. Uh, so I use those on a very limited basis on special request only. 
What else can you do? I have a lot of patients that don't want any anti-inflammatories. They don't want any injections. They want to use herbs and supplements and over-the-counter things. These people are interesting uh, to deal with, but there's a lot of things on the market. Dr. Murthy wanted me to stick with literature-based treatments, so the first thing I'm going to mention is cherry juice. <laughs> <laughs> cherry juice I learned about in my Asana Rebel Yoga app, nice. which I have a streak of 300 days doing that. I feel nice. really limber uh, from it. Uh, but cherry juice has uh, anthocyanins, which are potent anti-inflammatories, supposedly decrease arthritic pain, according to Asana Rebel. So I think that might be a, a pain-free thing to do. Turmeric curcumin, uh, they are anti-inflammatory blockers of COX-2 and 5 LOX. They may help. You've got other things like green-lipped mussels, who knew, uh, but they uh, decrease uh, prostaglandin production. And then there's the also... Has to have green lips. They have their green lips. I've never actually seen a green lip muscle, but I will give you a right. gift certificate to the local muscle right. restaurant in Got town it. in Baltimore for that. Right. Uh, and then CBD oil. That does everything. Helps you sleep, reduces stress, anxiety, pain. It really cures everything. It's, uh, it's helped me uh, grow my hair back, too, so I think that's <laughs> a good thing. Um, there's a million other uh, roots. Uh, on the far uh, bottom left is cat's claw. The next one over is stinging nettle. The next one over the orange is the curcumin and turmeric. Rhino horn, that's a safe and humane uh, uh, technique for animals. I think that's good for your uh, arthritis. Cherry juice is next, and this is thunder god root on the far right. It has some uh, serious side effects, uh, including amenorrhea and uh, uh, so maybe even death if you use the, the flowers. Don't use that unless you use the root. What do I do? Everybody gets, oh, sorry, this is hyaluronic acid. I forgot about this whole slide. Um, hyaluronic acid, what does the uh, AOS tell you? They can't support it. Several studies with conflicting results. Physical therapy, AOS uh, says it probably can help. Injectable biologics, they can't recommend it because the data is not there. And the other supplements that I mentioned, can't really recommend for or against it. What do I do? Cherry juice, uh, seafood restaurants, and CBD. Uh, no kidding. Uh, start with <laughs> basic stuff, anti-inflammatories, activity modification, although that's harder, than, uh, harder to do than, than to say. Toradol injections over cortisone, HA injections, PRP if they want it, uh, and uh, it's over-the-counter supplements, roots, if the patient wants to, uh, to go that direction. The one thing I'll add is it's important to follow these patients routinely. Different uh, arthritic wear patterns like the B1 glenoids can progress, so serial x-rays over six months is probably a reasonable thing to do to watch for that progression. Excellent. That's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So next up, my brother from another mother, Luke Austin, Rothman Institute. Tell oh, we're very similar. Um, he's going to talk to us about uh, arthroscopic debridement, the CAM procedure, and interposition. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, Matt. Now I know how to treat my patient from Woodstock, so that'll, that'll help me out a bunch. Um, I'm going to actually focus on CAM procedure because I've only actually taken out interposition, so I, I can't advocate for that. Um, so this is a niche procedure, there's no question about that, and they're very young, and more mild arthritis uh, is when, it, when I see this, uh, these, these pictures here is what I'm talking about. There's certainly risk factors that increase the chance of failing, and that's actually worse arthritis, bigger bone spurs, less joint space. Anybody with glenoid bone loss, B2, C glenoids are, are people that really are contraindicated for this. So what is the evidence, and uh, Dr. Murthy here, uh, my, my brother from uh, whatever he said, um, you know, he said, don't spend too much time on evidence-based medicine on this talk. Use a lot of opinion. Um, and, and that was good for me because there really is no evidence on this. Uh, Millet, who described this, uh, said in his original study, 85% survivorship at two years. The follow-up study showed 77% survivorship at five years. And when you're looking at survivorship as your outcome, that's concerning. But, um, but this is what we got. Uh, and a friend of mine, a lawyer, said, when you can't argue your own case, you better... Um, you know, just debunk somebody else's. So here's Matt Garbarino who gets to argue our most elegant procedure, the total shoulder. But um, the outcomes aren't that good, actually, in the young patient. These are all uh, findings from JSES. At two years, a third of patients are showing prosthetic loosening. Twice the revision rate. At 10 years, 40% may need revision. Higher rate of residual pain. One in five are unhappy with limitations. And young males get infections. That's catastrophic, Matt. We don't want that. Um, so in young patients with arthritis, alternative surgical interventions may be appropriate, and that's what this is, the CAM procedure. So as described by Millet, you've got to do glenohumeral debridement, humeral osteoplasty, capsular release, uh, axillary neurolysis, and then additional procedures. But most of us know how to do a lot of this, but he really focused on the axillary nerve decompression, so that's what I'm going to show you here. So this is a patient you might use it on, grade two and three changes. 
delamination of the cartilage. So you got to debride all this, but we're going to skip right down to the hard part of the procedure. So we're going to go in the inferior gutter. You're going to find your humeral head osteophyte. You're going to localize for your portal with a spinal needle that you want to get the front of the back of that osteophyte. You're then going to replace this with a switching stick, as you can see here, to really find that inferior lateral portal. And then you're going to cannulate it, and it's usually a little inferior and lateral to your viewing portal, and that's what you're going to work out of for the rest of this portion of the procedure. So then you'd perform a synovectomy. This will give you better visualization of the inferior gutter um, and your inferior osteophyte. So then you're going to perform your humeral osteoplasty. I like a shaver and softer bone. You can use a burr, um, but I think this is a little bit safer. You certainly want to leave the capsule on while you're doing this and do that portion of the procedure second. And what I'll do is I'll start with the arm in external rotation and get that posterior inferior osteophyte. And as I bring the arm into internal rotation, it'll bring around that more anterior osteophyte. And what you can see is actually when you are done doing this, your inferior gutter has more space and you have decompressed that axillary nerve quite a bit with just this portion of the procedure. You can really see that here. So the next step is to remove the inferior capsule and I'll use a straight biter to do that coming from posterior uh, portal once again and I'll make uh, a window between the capsule inferiorly and the muscle uh, below that and I'll, I'll take that bite moving posterior to anterior. As far as I can see, I, I will safely take these bites and as you do this, you will see the axillary nerve which courses from anterior uh, medial underneath the subscapularis to posterior lateral around the humerus and the teres minor and as you can see, as you're taking more of this capsule, the axillary nerve will start to show up in that uh, direction. Once you can see it, you can take some of the capsule away because you know where the axillary nerve is. And then you'll do your axillary neur neurolysis, and I'll use a switching stick, once again through that posterior portal. I'll find the plane between what's left of the, uh, the inferior capsule and the axillary nerve, uh, sweeping medial and lateral. And if you do this long enough, that axillary nerve will come into your visualization. And then lastly, you can come back in with your straight biter, complete that inferior capsular release, and you have a complete neurolysis done. So conclusion, in the young patient, mild arthritis, A-type glenoids, a CAM procedure can give you an opportunity to alleviate pain, improve range of motion, and hopefully delay an arthroplasty. Thank you. That was pretty slick. That was awesome. So we're going to go next to uh, Peter Johnston. Uh, Peter's uh, from nearby in Leonardtown. He's part of our shoulder fellowship. Uh, hemi bearing surfaces for the treatment of young OA. Thanks, Anna, and thanks to the organizers. So these are challenging patients, all right? There's a number of complicating factors that we deal with. They commonly have instability arthropathy, malunion. They've had previous surgeries, hardware, soft tissue contractures. They also had significant acquired deformity on the glenoid. I think the most challenging thing we deal with in these patients are their expectations, and they're often out of balance with what we can <laughs> offer them. So they come on all shapes and sizes, mostly like that guy, um, and then all sorts of glenoid morphologies. Who is it right for, hemiarthroplasty? And this is a line from Rick Matson that I really like, and I structure my conversations with patients about. Pain relief with a desire for no lifting restrictions, willing to balance a potentially higher revision rate with a restriction-free lifestyle. So how can we be better than we've been in the past? We can avoid glenoid wear and medialization. We can identify a good, long-term, durable solution. And then ultimately, I think we need to identify the best way to manage glenoid deformity and create a concentric bearing surface for the humerus. So not all hemis are created equal. Do we ream? Do we just run? Do we do micro perforations to enhance the biology at the joints line? Do we resurface the glenoid? Or do we consider alternative bearing surfaces we're really going to talk about today? So I bring up this slide not to dick around and review the literature, but these are two case series. The first, Dr. Matson, The second, Dr. Williams and Dr. Lazarus. And I use it to bring up two points. A revision rate of 14% and 25% in under four years in the best of hands, number one. Number two, both of these series use the ream and run philosophy, so creating a concentric joint so the humeral head is centered on the glenoid. So glenoid resurfacing, I think this talk would be uh, unkept if I didn't talk about it. There's a lot of options out there, but I think Serena said it best, patients and surgeons must be willing to accept significant complication rate 
and likelihood for reoperation. And this has been proved over and over since 2011. So pyrolytic carbon, or pyrocarbon, what is it? It was originally brought about in the 1960s to contain nuclear fuel. In the 1970s, uh, surgeons at the Mayo Clinic used it in heart, bileaflet heart valves. And then in the 80s and 90s, it entered the orthopedic realm in PCP, or MCP joint replacements and then scaphoid uh, replacement. Basically, at the turn of the century, I think the challenge has been how do we incorporate the pyrocarbon that you see with that small orange arrow, that lining on that graphite substrate, onto that metal collar, and then have it sit on a humeral stem. So how does pyrocarbon work? It's very smooth, the lowest friction factor of any orthopedic implant ever used. There's essentially no wear against human tissue, and there's actually data to support. There's actually neo, it's a biologically active substrate with, which creates neocartilage generation and has much better uh, preservation than compared to metal, metallic alloys. And it, it's also important that it has a modulus of elasticity very close to bone. So let's look at it in the lab, and I'll be quick with this, but basically comparing cobalt chrome and pyrocarbon on cadaveric glenoids. They basically concluded the testing with the cobalt chrome after 320,000 cycles and after 5 million cycles with the pyrocarbon, and they demonstrated a 30 times bone penetration and volume loss and overall surface roughness with the cobalt chrome when compared to the pyrocarbon. Oh, reverse. So clinically, what's out Not there? Not reverse. No reverse. Yeah, no, 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 sorry. Reverse. Yeah. So uh, how does it work clinically? These are Pascal Below patients uh, under, under uh, for your follow-up, and as we'd expect, improvement in range of motion, functional scores, they were able to get them back to very high demand uh, jobs, but they still had a revision rate of around 8%. So where do we stand here in the United States? There was an IDE trial. Uh, we enrolled 157 patients among 18 centers across the country. We've completed the two-year follow-up, and we're still kind of navigating the regulatory pathways with the FDA. We're actually starting our five- and seven-year follow-up now. So I'm just going to show you a case here. This is a 35-year-old male with history of previous shoulder instability, posterior subluxation, B2 glenoid. So interoperatively, how would we manage the glenoid? So for me, this is a contouring. I use a pineapple burr, take down the paleo glenoid, create a biologically friendly surface, and create a concentric surface so that pyrocarbon head can look, sit centered on the glenoid. So there's our first post-operative uh, visit right there. You can see the head is nicely centered. We've gotten rid of the biconcavity. So in conclusion, pyrocarbon hemiarthroplasty demonstrates good, early, kind of promising results. Obviously, it requires long-term data. And then I think we're gonna, we have a subgroup analysis going on on how we are going to manage these B2 glenoids so we can get a concentric joint surface. Great. Now hailing from New Jersey, Matt Garbarina, total shoulder replacement, the gold standard in the 50-year-old. You guys all have something in common with my teenage daughter in that I'm the only thing standing between you and your next beer, so I'll try, and, <laughs> try to be quick here. So I'm going to talk about uh, total shoulder replacement in patients under 50. So when we're talking about any kind of treatment option for any problem in orthopedics, we're looking at what gives us pain relief, improved function, durability, and reliability. We don't always have the situation or the patient in front of us that we want. We have to deal with the situation that the patient have in front of us. And so age is a factor, but I would argue it's not the only factor when we're treating these younger patients with arthritis. So when you see somebody with arthritis under 50, often it's a little bit of a different etiology in some of our elder patients. Some of them will have post-instability arthropathy with some anterior contracture, uh, posterior subluxation with some eccentric loading and posterior erosion. And I would argue that this doesn't really set up long-term for some of the lesser treatments that we described before. Uh, a recent French study showed that visco-supplementation, PRP, about 86% of patients, that can give you relief for about three and a half years. Arthroscopic treatment, just over half for about three and a half years. The problem is the average age of the patients with this type of, uh, of arthropathy was about 36. And by my math, three and a half years under that is still pretty young. And also, if you look at some of the things that set up for a poor result with a CAM procedure, loss of joint space with less than two millimeters of joint space, uh, greater than 50% of your articular cartilage lost, lost off the glenoid side. At this point, you're starting to think about your arthroplasty options, uh, and then sometimes it's set up for you a little bit more clearly like with this. So then you have to really decide, are we going to go with hemiarthroplasty or are we going to go with some sort of 
total shoulder arthroplasty, um, and then a nuclear bomb was dropped on my talk earlier today. I think it was launched from Texas, and I guess we're going to add that on uh, <laughs> a little bit later. Uh, but I think you can make an argument that you can feel pretty good about doing a total shoulder replacement uh, with polyethylene glenoid uh, in the right patient. So if we're looking at pain relief, uh, the CPG uh, guidelines from the AAOS, there's enough studies showing that total shoulder arthroplasty uh, provides uh, superior pain relief to hemiarthroplasty, and that also holds true in younger patients. Uh, a study out of Harvard showed that um, even though there were so, uh, survival rates of about 95% uh, in total shoulder replacements at 10 years and 70% in HEMIs, one of, uh, one of the reasons, or the main reason that the HEMIs uh, were unsatisfied uh, was pain. Uh, and so there was a high rate of unsatisfaction despite the fact that they lasted fairly long. So this holds true in younger patients that your total shoulder placements are gonna give you better pain relief. And again, there are just certain things you have to be honest about uh, when you're considering arthroscopic treatment. Similarly, with functional improvement, uh, if you look at constant scores or ASES uh, scores, total shoulder replacement in that study is going to show better function in the younger patients. But what we've seen from a meta-analysis is that the uh, highly satisfied patients with total shoulder about 10 years uh, after replacement in this younger group is about 70%, and it's mainly because they have higher expectations. So that's uh, a conversation you have to have with them a little bit earlier, and you might want to say to them, look, you know, it's a lot easier to operate on your workout routine than it is to operate on your shoulder again. And the analogy that Jerry used to give is, I'm putting $50,000 in your bank account. How are you going to spend it? Are you going to, you know, chuck the ball around with your kid, and that's like putting it in a muni bond? Or are you going to go, you know, operate a jackhammer or do bench press and military press, which is like taking to Vegas? Uh, so setting expectations is really important. And then when you look at durability and reliability, um, you know, Two things to consider here. The five and 10 year survival rates are going to be superior to hemiarthroplasty. It's not always huge. Out of the Australian uh, registry, it was about 11% versus 7% uh, revision rate at 10 years. And in that French study, it was more like 13% and 9% at about six years. Um, so it is more durable with the, the total shoulder replacement. But the thing that I would be more concerned about is that if you ever have to convert a hemiarthroplasty to a total shoulder, um, you're going to get inferior results compared to a primary TSA. So you could end up with a situation where five years after the index procedure, you have a patient who's had two surgeries doing worse than they would have done uh, with a single surgery. And another thing that should take a little bit of the trepidation about doing a total shoulder revision, um, not only the lower revision, but also the fact that revision surgery is getting a little bit. Also, if you look at some of the studies, especially back from Mayo studies from like the early 2000s, you know, I think our techniques in putting total shoulder replacement are just getting better. So, you know, Dr. Uh, uh, Krishnan gave us a great example of how to get a standard stem out, but when you have uh, a, a stemless or even a short stem, you have less spot welds in the short stem, it's going to be easier to get out. Revision surgery might be a little less daunting. Uh, if you ever have a stemless um, uh, implant fail early and you have to revise it, it's about five minutes to take it out. Ask me how I know that. So this is going to be a little bit easier in the future uh, when we're doing revision. And also, I think our techniques overall are getting better. You know, the importance of uh, making the humeral head size perfect, as Dr. Abood likes to say, undersized, revised, uh, patient-specific instrumentation and uh, computer navigation to try and get the glenoid position uh, and proper treatment of subscapular power. So I think there are things to look forward to that can make us feel a little bit more bullish about total shoulder replacement longevity. So in summary, certain patients under 50 can't be adequately treated non-operatively or through scope. Their next level care includes arthroplasty, TSA provides better pain relief function uh, than most of the HA variants, uh, specifically the ones with posterior glenoid wear, uh, as Peter had mentioned earlier, but alternative bearing surfaces uh, do show promise. So patient education is important. Our primary and revision techniques uh, are giving us some more hope for the future, and Butch digs the reverse. Thanks. Butch, are you still there? Testing, still here. All right, so we're going to have one more talk, and then uh, I'm going to give you some questions and some closing remarks, okay? Yeah, sounds good. Right. So our last talk, Mark Kowalski. Uh, we've learned a lot about OA, and perhaps reverse shoulder replacement is the solution for all arthritis in the shoulder. Let's see. Uh, Anand, if you can start my time at about the fourth or fifth <laughs> slide. There's, <laughs> there's some introductory comments. All right. My disclosures are listed. So, you know, I had to do some quick research on social media, scour the internet on my opponents here on the debate. I think that Matt, you know, talked to us about the role of yoga and cherry juice and a good night's sleep for the treatment of arthritis. I think that's no surprise. 
Um, you know, I found this one. <laughs> Luke, uh, when I saw him in his weight, weightlifting routine in between cases, I thought, you know, maybe this debate's going to be a, a slam dunk for me. I think that's a one pound weight, if I'm not mistaken. Um, finally, uh, Matt, you know, this is him counseling a patient on uh, rotator cuff disease, and I think if it's that hard to convince his patient of his bursitis, then again, I think this is going to be a home run. I think Peter was the tough one, a bit of a black box, an impeccable footprint on social media. I really couldn't find a whole lot, uh, unfortunately. I'll keep digging, though, for the next go-round. Um, so, uh, you know, there, are, there is some literature in here. I think, you know, as we start to talk about the increasing role of reverse, the data becomes important, but you can read the body of the slides for the data and the titles for the themes. Uh, you've heard some of these themes already. Total shoulder arthroplasty is not the panacea we once thought. And there's a, many systematic reviews that have begun to show us that there's increasing rates of glenoid lucency, a fairly significant complication and revision uh, rate, uh, admittedly predictable pain relief and outcomes, um, but inferior results in younger patients when you compare the outcomes to our older uh, cohort. And again, a number of more recent studies have shown this. 200 patients, 55 years old, nine-year follow-up. Survivorship plummets to 60% when you get out to 15 or 27, I'm sorry, 15 or 20 years with, a, with still a significant reoperation rate and a significant rate not just of glenoid lucency, but glenoid loosening, and this does correlate with constant. Another study of 55-year-old uh, patients showed, again, increasing rates of glenoid lucency and decreasing constant scores from the medium to the long term. So we know short and medium term outcomes are good, not so sure about the medium to long term jump. And this was a military health system database of, of 26 shoulders and found, it, again, increasing rates of complications and reoperation. And when they looked at their patients just at two years, they found that only 40% were able to maintain active duty with total shoulders. And finally, a, a prospective database of over 5,000 patients showing that the younger aged patient was at a significantly increased risk of mechanical failure, infection, reoperation, and revision. And this risk only begins to decrease year by year when you get beyond the age of 50. The problem with these patients, as we've already talked about, is that there's multiple modes of failure. We've talked a lot about the well-documented rates of glenoid lucency and loosening. And we've also touched on the rotator cuff insufficiency that can occur over time. This study of 700 patients showed that while the rate of cuff disease is fairly low at 10 years, it increases significantly when you get out to 15 years. And Butch touched on, on the fact that, you know, what we're taught about the longevity of totals isn't really what we tend to experience in practice. So some will advocate in that younger patient performing the total as you've been told you should, and then just revising it to a reverse if you happen to encounter painful loosening or cuff disease. But just like in the hemi to total shoulder conversion discussion, the outcomes of a converted reverse are not nearly as good as the primary reverse in the first place, with a significant increased risk of complications and lower patient satisfaction scores. So perhaps you're better off doing the reverse primarily. So the other side of that coin is that, rota uh, is that reverse shoulder arthroplasty failure is perhaps overstated. And this stems from that survivorship study from Servo and Walsh that showed 30% failure rate beyond seven years. So they advocated reserving this procedure only for that pure indication of cuff disease and only in the elderly patient. And that's where that strict sort of age criterion came from. What we've learned from Mark Frankel and Derek Cuff and others is that, is that reverse shoulder arthroplasty is a durable solution. In their series at 10 years, they had 90% survivorship with low rates of notching and impressive range of motion um, results. And this is in part due to the innovations in design that we've talked a lot about. And the, the topic of, of this debate is arthritis. And what we know about arthritis and reverse is that this is the very best patient cohort. Patients with arthritis in this series of over 300 patients showed the very best outcome. And the pure indication, cuff tears and cuff tear arthropathy, showed the worst outcome. And when Andy Jawa and his team looked specifically at acromion stress fractures, which we also talked about, he found that the vast majority of stress fractures occur in the cuff disease cohort, and only a small minority occurred in the osteoarthritis. So reverse shoulder arthroplasty does very well in arthritis. Reverse shoulder arthroplasty also does well in young patients. There's not just case series that have shown this. There's a several systematic reviews that have shown good results in the youngest patients with manageable complication and reoperation rates, 
decent range of motion scores. And when you compare younger patients to older patients, younger patients actually did better with their reverse. And the survivorship exceeds 90% in those studies that had adequate follow-up. A more recent study from 2020 sh showed similar outcomes, but an even lower rate of complications and an even lower rate of reop. Finally, when you compare reverse to totals, you find that they, at the very least, do the same. They have equivalent complication rates, equivalent reoperation rates, and equivalent outcome scores, with the one caveat that, yes, totals do have slightly better rotation. And Butch touched on the fact that complications and reoperations can actually be lower in the reverse shoulder arthroplasty group. Um, I think there was a discussion earlier about a concern that our younger patients are going to place increased stress on the implants, which might lead to premature failure. What Quinn Throckmorton actually showed, though, when he compared activity levels of his younger reverses and his older reverses, we actually, he actually found them to be equivalent. So he concluded that these young patients are actually self-correcting in order to do what they have to do in life functionally and what they want to do recreationally while still protecting. So guiding principles for me with respect to reverse in young patients for arthritis, the longevity and outcomes of totals are perhaps overstated. The failure rate of reverses beyond seven years also overstated. Reverse arthroplasty perform well in arthritis. They perform well in young patients, and they also seem to be a durable procedure. And um, you know, we know that the failure mechanism of the current design of reverse isn't yet known, but will likely have more to do with polyethylene wear rather than failure of the implants themselves. And just like a total shoulder can be uh, revised at a later time, reverses can also be revised with reliable. Thanks a lot. You know, we, uh, we asked Mark to do that really late, like a few days ago, and that was, you hit it out of the park. That was a great talk on, on reverse for OA. I just have a couple of questions for the panel, and then we'll have, have Butch uh, speak. Uh, what I wanted to ask Luke was, what do you, what's causing the pain that you're relieving? How are you relieving the pain with these two things, chondroplasty and the nerve decompression? So uh, the thought, at least as um, Peter Millet talks about it, is uh, that there's this posterior lateral pain around the deltoid, and in patients with that, that may actually be coming from compression on the axillary nerve. So if you decompress the axillary nerve in a patient with a lot of posterior lateral pain, maybe you will make that pain better. Uh, I've done this, and I think Jerry has too. I've done open inferior subscap take down, take the chi do a chylectomy, nerve decompression essentially with the biceps, and they come the week later they're like completely pain free. It's it's crazy. So I think there is something too doing the nerve decompression and removing those osteophytes. Um, Joe and who else who else and Peter have been on the ID for the pyrocarbon. You know it's ID for the pyrocarbon, right? What do you think, Peter? How are they how are they doing anecdotally? I mean, clinically, the patients look great. Yeah. They're very happy. I, I, early, we, like early on, happy or? I, I mean, I saw a five-year follow-up last yeah. week, and um, but I, we are seeing some medialization, okay. without a doubt. Joe, yeah. So I mean, for that group, I, I definitely picked the worst of the worst patients that were very young. I thought it was a very good option for them, and I have patients now that are, I think, about five years out. I am seeing some glenoid erosion, but they're very happy with their outcomes so far, and their pain level was very good. We had, uh, I was involved in designing the pyrocarbon resurfacing that was done in Australia, and it was taken off the market due to some fracking. But before that, that their two-year in their registry, these are really incredible results. It forms like this surfactant layer sometimes that prevents it from eroding too soon. Um, those were great topics. You know, we don't know the answer yet for OA in a 50-year-old, so I'm going to give that, I'm going to give two questions to Butch to finish it off. Butch, do you believe in any of those cuff repair or salvage procedures? SCR, tendon transfers, or is it just time to uh, pop the balloon and go to reverse? Well, you know, for the last uh, 20 years, as, as you know, Anand, I've tried to sew every single thing possible to the glenoid, and I don't know how I can sew an SCR in and look somebody in the eyes and tell them they have a 47% failure rate. But hey, it's a great operation. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, that's have, awesome. That's good. That's good. I have no dog in that hunt, and I wish Paul all of the success with the royalties he might get from this. But in my hands, I'd probably just uh, really either move to non-op or do my single operation. In and, that, uh, yeah. and how about the 50-year-old OA cuff intact? You know, this is the one, right? This yep. is the one that we all need to hit out of the park. So the question I ask to everybody there, when you're 50, what do you want in your, in your shoulder? And for me, if I have no deformity, you know, we did a lot of hemiarthroplasties with biologic interposition. 
And, you know, even a blind pig can find a golden apple. Every now and then we, uh, we got it right. And they did really well if they were concentric arthritics. And I had a guy who uh, I did, he was 35 years old, typical meathead bodybuilder. They did a hemi biologic on. He comes back 10 years later, which is a year ago. And now he has B2 glenoid on the other side. He loves his hemi biologic. But he's got a B2 glenoid really eroded. So I said, fine, I'm going to do a reverse. So he gets infected, hates it. I have to take it out, do a two-stage operation, finally reimplant. And then he, he comes back after his one-year follow-up and says, why didn't you just do what you did 10 years ago? So I think we still, uh, we still don't know the answer. But um, tying it up, Anand, if, uh, if you're done with questions, I just had four comments I wanted to make about this meeting. If, yeah. uh, if, yeah. Please. Uh, from my text messages last night and what I saw at the start of this meeting, uh, it's clear that Larry Galata does not have a wooden leg, but <laughs> Joe Abood and Anand Murthy do. <laughs> Number two, what I learned through the morning is that, you know, Jerry Williams is incredibly humble and what an amazing man who's been in and just incredible. He talks about giants, but, but, you know, Jerry, incredible. The third one, this is really important. You know, the family feud was incredible, but team near, all of you need to come to my operating room. We only listen to rock music in my operating room. <laughs> Jackson is not rock music. Okay. And I think it was Charlie Jobin who also threw Thriller out there. Guys, what is happening in New York City? I mean, back in <laughs> all time greatest rock album ever. We start with Thunderstruck every day in my operating room. Yeah, so, all right. And finally, I'd like, I'd like to ask everybody sitting there, please turn around and look at AV in the back left of the room. Turn around right now. Look at the AV guys, back left of the room. I'm right there in the little camera. I've been watching everybody. And this has been an incredible experience. I literally have not moved out of the workstation in my hospital because I've been so enthralled by this. And I can't thank everyone for the privilege of, of invitation. So thank you. Thanks, Butch. Well, as we end this uh, restart uh, after the pandemic of our, our Massis uh, journey, Bruce, uh, Butch, it was really a uh, privilege to have you here. It was almost lifelike, you know, that... Uh, dual AV program you had was incredible. Uh, I can't wait to see you, brother, in real life. Stay safe and healthy. To our team, Katie, Jenny, everyone who put this program together, Wim, uh, I know I'm missing some people. We appreciate it. It went off without a hitch. It was incredible. Uh, I want to thank all of our, our residents and fellows and trainees who came here. We hope you guys learned from everyone. And it, it's a labor of love for the four of us. We'll do it again. We start in a week for next year, right? We'll get the agenda rolling, and uh, we hope to see you guys all next year. Uh, but there are cocktails next door, so let's go.